You're listening to the Savage Sack Attack. It's not a podcast. It's not a half cast. It's just a quick shot to the balls to help you finish off the week. We're cutting through the bullshit, filling your Friday with rage fueled logic, and cracking a few jokes along the way. So grab a bag of frozen peas. There's a savage sack tap coming your way. Smooth, lascivious, salacious, outrageous. Oh, hey, I, uh, I didn't, uh, didn't hear you guys come in. Yeah, I was just trying to get my internet outrage machine fired up here. Must be something wrong with the, uh, flux capacitor, I think. Maybe. Might need a new Johnson rod in here. One more try. Huh. Can't, can't seem to get it to start, which is weird, because, uh, Everyone else seems to have theirs running uh, 24-7 these days. Oh, well. Onward and upward. And uh, welcome to the uh, Savage Sack Tap here. Oh, just a little uh, cheeky little jab at all the internet morons out there to uh, start the show. <laughs> a, little, uh, a little canned laughter. All right, yeah. The, uh, the Savage Sack Tap was recorded in front of a live studio audience. Okay, now what if I want to make out with someone? All right, all right, and uh, I just got caught cheating on the big test. All right, all right, enough, enough. We're uh, we're driving listeners away by the second here. Uh, yeah, we have a uh, we have a lot to discuss today: uh, radical Islam, racist cleaning products, and unscrupulous soft drink marketing, uh, among other things. So I will dispense with the pleasantries and uh, get straight to the point, yeah? Just seems like everyone's uh, internet outrage machine has been running on absolute overdrive for the past, um, I don't know, when did Twitter become a thing? Like, 2009? Who the fuck knows? Anyway, as I, as I sort of discussed in the uh, Savage Hour last week, internet outrage is the new uh, social little black dress. Uh, everyone owns one and they use it for literally every occasion. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, pipe down, pipe down. All right. Um, yeah, by now, I I think we all kind of know how the cycle works, too, right? Some poor schlub commits, you know, a minor offense, uh, a few internet nutcases latch on to the, uh, the minor slight and go ahead and blow it completely out of proportion, and then your mass media outlets pick up on it, and uh, they report it as, as legitimate and, uh, and sort of praise the internet nutcases for for their bravery and in the face of such cruel and insensitive oppression and try to make it look like a, a real progressive struggle. Um, and they, they force the schlub to issue this formal apology and that the schlub has to promise to be, you know, more sensitive to the plight of, of gluten intolerant Mexican limousine drivers or uh, gender nonconforming Eskimo ska enthusiasts or, you know, um, Czechoslovakian members of NAMBLO or, you know, whatever, Whatever the uh, bizarre fringe group that's pretending to be offended may feel like complaining about. This week, the uh, the targets were the uh, the good people. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the bigoted cocksuckers at Clorox, if you have an internet connection. Now, you may be wondering, what, what could a company that produces cleaning supplies possibly have done to offend the mouth-breathing internet masses? Well, apparently... They had just finished bleaching their uh, clan hoods and were preparing for their daily reading from Mein Kampf when the uh, social media team at Clorox sent out the following heinous tweet. Where's the bleach? And uh, it had a picture of a, a bunch of emojis of things like, uh, you know, wine glasses and, and other items that could potentially cause a stain, which a consumer might presumably use a product like Clorox's famed bleach to clean up. And while this may seem innocent enough to the casual web surfer, to the professionally offended masses of 2015, the uh, the tweet was anything but in, uh, innocent. You see, the tweet happened to be sent out on the same day that a new series of ethnic emojis were released. Yes, yes, I uh, I know. The, the horror. It appears now, at, at least to the highly delusional, that the tweet was uh, meant to say that the new line of ethnic emojis needed to be whitewashed. Yeah. Of fucking course. 
And this was apparently important enough to get attention from the big brains at big media, naturally. I'm sorry. That's what Clorox is saying after they've gotten themselves into the middle of a social media mishap. It happened after Apple rolled out new emojis in its latest update. Digital reporter Meg Shaw back to explain. Meg, what happened? Yeah, fucking jackasses. And of course, Clorox responded by apologizing with the following message. Wish we could bleach away our last tweet. Didn't mean to offend. It was meant to be about all the emojis that could use a cleanup. But of course, you know, once the internet psychos smell blood in the water, you know, it's, it's on. Here's, here's what the masses had to say. Wit Khalifa writes, I can DM my resume if y'all need a new social media manager. Yes, yes. Very, very witty indeed, Mr. Khalifa. Um, I'm, I'm sure it is a very impressive resume, too. Um, top of his class at Harvard, for sure. Wit Khalifa. Uh, at Diva D 1114 who is uh, presumably a professional meteorologist and uh, could sense the shitstorm approaching, offered this advice. I think y'all should log off now. It's about to get real, and I can tell y'all aren't ready. And she also uh, advised uh, her followers to be sure to stock up on non-perishable food items and remember to never run a generator indoors. Uh, storm joke. You yeah. suck! <laughs> uh, Master of Race Relations at Breezy Bree 3 provided her own insight. Shut up. It's time for you to get dragged by... Hashtag Black Twitter. Ah, that's good. That's constructive. At Miss Niara says, Black people, skin bleaching, keeping the emojis white, etc. They don't want us to be great. Yeah. Uh, of, of, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. I can just, I can just picture it now, right? Yeah, the, uh, the PR squad from Clorox on a, uh, a corporate retreat to a huge southern plantation. They're all using copies of the Emancipation Proclamation to clean up the big white gobs of cum after their team-building circle jerks, and they're playing raucous games of hangman using ethnic slurs before they head outside to uh, enjoy a, a burning cross bonfire while they all s stand around and, uh, and sing Ted Nugent songs together. <laughs> yeah. The gift bag comes with a, uh, a Duck Dynasty DVD box set. <laughs> yeah, fucking idiots. And of course, the uh, the one stirring the pot, the, uh, the main rabble rouser, is at Dree Nicole, who offered gems like this. Why is the tweet still there? You need to clean up your PR person. Put some bleach on your distasteful marketing ideas. And uh, this one, which... I can assure you absolutely did not require um, a massive and flawed uh, leap in logic. Black emojis were added today, saying this implies you'd rather the emojis be only white by adding bleach. This shark, swallow you whole, shaking, tenderizing, down you go. Yeah. Oh, the fucking humanity. <laughs> quite, quite horrifying. Yeah, they they may as well have elected Jim Crow himself to the uh, the Clorox Board of Trustees. And this is the problem with Twitter, right? It it's given a voice to people who should never have had a voice to begin with. And sadly, as a proponent of free and dangerous speech, I have to defend the right of idiots like this to uh, spout their race baiting fucking nonsense. Does anyone actually believe that Clorox wanted this tweet to be interpreted as uh, some sort of corporate call to whitewash society into one great big Caucasian masterclass? Or do we think that maybe they were just you know, making a, a, a joke about cleaning red wine stains off of a fucking carpet? Which one of those seems more plausible? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> um... Ms. Nicole describes herself, by the way, as a, uh, a community organizer from Detroit. Is a, seems to me to be a bit of a, a dubious title. If I claimed to be a community organizer from anywhere, I'd, I'd probably go with a community that was, uh, that was actually organized and, and had its shit together. A, uh, a community organizer from Spring Lake or uh, Upper Saddle River or 
you know, fucking Denver, San Fran. You know. Oh, yeah, you organized one of those. Nice fucking job, man. Hey, doing good. <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> the, maybe not the best star to hitch your wagon to, Ms. Nicole. Uh, Camden and Newark were, uh, were already taken. <laughs> um, but what end does this serve? The tweet was not racist, as any logical person can plainly see. Clorox took it down and apologized because corporations are, you know, huge sopping fucking pussies. But for Jeree Nicole, this is like, this is a watershed moment in uh, in her career of online slacktivism. Uh, she just got one of the, the big boys of the cleaning product industry to uh, bow down and and scrub the grout from the bathroom floor of society, I guess. Uh, so, nice job. For, for, uh, for at least a week, she gets to be internet famous, and uh, in the eyes of the social justice community, uh, that actually makes her royalty. So, Congratulations, Dre Nicole. Enjoy, uh, enjoy feasting on that 15 minutes of uh, slacktivist fame. When you're, when you're done, go ahead and, and watch that, uh, that last bite down with a tall glass of Clorox, because, uh, you know, shit like this does absolutely nothing to improve race relations in the U.S. You know, the, the problem here is not that people are espousing an opinion that I happen to disagree with, because I personally think that uh, disagreement's pretty important, right? It leads to debate and ensures that we're making you know, reasonable and intelligent choices, but, you know, on, once again, the the reaction from the online masses in this case was uh, far from far from reasonable, and that has become the rule as opposed to the exception. And I think that civil rights leaders like Dr. King and, and Rosa Parks, who, uh, you know, they faced angry German shepherds, you know, police batons and fire hoses and burning crosses and death threats and, and actual assassination attempts. And Dre Nicole has faced none of that. You know, she simply saw an opportunity to grow her personal activist brand by taking aim at a, a corporation on a public forum. Uh, she espoused a view that it was clear there were there are enough morons out there who will agree with her so she can score herself a nice fat piece of publicity. Now, this was never about racism or equality. This was, this was about boosting her own overinflated ego and and promoting herself as a uh, as as an activist and a community organizer. So, kudos on a uh, a job well done. I'm sure, there will be a a spot on Reverend Al's PR team opening up for you in the uh, the near future. White folks was in the cave when we had built empires. We learned to admire them, but they knew to admire us. We built pyramids for Donald Trump. Ever knew what architecture was? <laughs> We taught philosophy and astrology and mathematics before Socrates and them Greek homos ever got around. Another fucking jackass. Or whether we have more to go to build a movement of resistance, but resist we much. We must and we will much about that be committed. I uh, just... It seems to me that the, the black leaders of the 1960s who actually fought for equality uh, and stared down actual lynch mobs might look at this web crusade and, and call your online lynch mob a, a huge fucking joke uh, where they still around to see it. But, you know, this is what happens. You, you know, you make a mockery of an otherwise legitimate cause by raising hell over what's really just an innocent tweet and you leave otherwise reasonable people so frustrated that they can no longer uh, no longer take you seriously, you know? and and then even when you when you eventually do have a valid point to make, you know you, they're they're going to turn a deaf ear. Um, happens every fucking time. As for Clorox, uh, apologizing to these idiots is more offensive than any tweet that you could possibly send out. Uh, you know until there's a backlash and public figures start telling these jackasses to uh, you know, go kick rocks. And then shit like this is just going to keep ha uh, happening, and and it doesn't help that you get outlets like the Huffington Post, uh, you know, they feed into the uh, the hysteria and run articles that that give these just completely bogus fucking gripes an air of legitimacy. You know, if you, we'd be all we'd all be better off if you guys would cut it the fuck out. 
you know, you're, you're, all you're doing is turning this country into a, a, a tepid sea of hypersensitive mental midgets. So it really, really sucks. And, you know, this, the, the same type of stupidity reared its head in another place uh, this past week. Students at the University of Michigan successfully lobbied to have a uh, showing of the movie American Sniper canceled. Surprisingly, the school actually turned around and then reversed the decision. Um, I think uh, old Coach Harbaugh may have had uh, something to do with that. So good job, Coach. But, yeah, it's just another move in the ongoing pussification of America. Uh, Muslim students complain that the film, which uh, is actually happens to be a, a, about a man's struggle with PTSD. It's not a pro or anti-war movie or a pro or anti-Muslim movie. Um, it's it's a it's a movie about PTSD and uh, that sort of private fight that Chris Kyle was battling. But you know, a Muslim student uh, coalition decided to lobby the school and said it was a, a source of anti-Muslim sentiment and uh, Islamophobia. That uh, yeah. The the term Islamophobia really didn't exist in the collective conscience, I think, until like late last year. That's a, a 2014 word, definitely, but it's gaining momentum. Uh, and by gaining momentum, I do not mean that it's becoming more and more popular in the U.S. to, you know, go out and just bash Muslims, because let's be honest, it's not. It is, however, getting more and more popular to depict Muslims as victims anytime the subjects of terrorism, uh, extremism, or fundamentalism are brought up. It's it's gotten to the point that you know even even in the me- the immediate aftermath of an attack like a Charlie Hebdo or something like that, uh, it's gotten to the point where anyone who alleges that there may be a problem within Islam uh, gets branded an Islamophobe and a racist by people who are on this. Uh, this sort of pseudo left, I like to call it. They're pseudo progressives because true progressives believe in in liberal ideas like um, like free speech and uh, women's rights and gay rights, etc. We'll get we'll get into that in a minute and how it applies here. But the this sort of pseudo left that uh, like the Hollywood left, like that Ben Affleck was, I think the first major celeb to uh, take up this stance, and Aziz Ansari and and others have sort of chimed in with their their own special brand of of ignorance. Uh, actually, I got I have a couple here. Let me uh, dig into uh, the old production production folder and uh, here, yeah, here. This is what I'm talking about. Now let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents. The people who would actually believe in an act that you murder somebody if they yes. Islam is not the majority of Muslims at oh all. Okay. Uh, is- in a decision so late in arriving, it is hard to believe France has finally recognized that Islamophobia does actually exist in their country. Certainly, the nation's leaders prefer to portray Muslims as a threat in an effort to justify destabilizing wars in places like Libya, Yemen, and many others. It- Your question is inherently Islamophobic and racist. A nonsense. Get over yourself. Who's responsible for these beheadings? Without them, we're nourishing those extremists who spread anti-Muslim hatred and seek to use violence. It eagerly feeds the public's desire for portrayals of Muslims as violent, sexist, and somehow inferior. I feel, uh, I'll give you the, the, the answer that you've asked me three times, I feel that the security services have time and again harassed people and pushed them and that has played a part in the radicalization of this man. The Islamophobia is a phenomenon which is underestimated and undertreated to say the least. Framing the extremist view is satirical weekly Charlie Hebdo, which was condemned around the world for its graphic and degrading images of Prophet Muhammad, but widely applauded in France. The argument about the female genital mutilation being an Islamic problem is a perfect example of that. It's not... Okay. You know, this is the problem is that these kinds of conversations that we're having aren't really being had in any kind of legitimate way. We're not talking about about women in the Muslim world, we're using two or three examples to justify a generalization. That's actually the definition of bigotry. All right, fair enough. Let's listen to Benjamin Netanyahu at the United Nations today. 
Well, ISIS is no more Islamic than the Westboro Baptist Church is, or the Crusaders are, or Andrus Brevik is, or anybody who commits violence in the name of faith. Well, statistically, there's no more uh, criminals from within the Muslim faith and terrorists within the Muslim faith throughout history as there has been criminals within the Christian faith. Yeah, they make it sound uh, they make it sound pretty bad, right? You know, the uh, the big bad bullies in the uh, the U.S. and Europe who clearly don't see Islam as the uh, the nuanced and special religion of peace that it is, and and they like to you know they point out that if you take a cursory glance at the history of say Christianity, that religion as well is marred by some pretty horrible atrocities uh, in its own right. That usually gets worked into the Islamophobia conversation and. You know what? That part actually is valid. I'm going to be honest. I'm an atheist. I, I'm not going to defend any one group's worshipping of the magic sky man over another because to be totally fucking upfront about it, I think they're all fucking dumb. But the buck sort of stops right there. Because I think if you look at the three largest religions on the planet, Islam is way out ahead of the pack when it comes to committing horrible atrocities in modern times. You know, the, yeah, you have the odd right-wing Christian nut who goes out and, and tries to bomb an abortion clinic once in a while, but when that happens, it doesn't get support from a fraction of the Christian community. He's immediately denounced as a, a fucking nut job, you know, they... There's not this uh, this air of celebration, you know. They're not dancing in the streets like uh, in in Palestine after those those three kids uh, were were kidnapped and uh, executed. You know, they were dancing in the fucking streets. It, that's you wouldn't, you know, when some dickhead goes out and bombs an abortion clinic, they're not they don't dance in the streets in Little Rock, Arkansas. So yeah, there are. There are extremists from every religion, but they're not celebrated and uh, deified. They're not – well, we don't refer to them as martyrs. You know, we refer to them as, as lunatic pieces of shit, right? Uh, and it's, it's also – it's not happening on an endemic scale because if it was, people would be going ballistic and they would have no problem talking about the problem in Christianity, which they do. They call out Christianity as problems. It's, it stands towards – uh, gays, uh, etc. But it's, you know, the problems that exist within Judaism and, and Christianity as the other two sort of uh, big religions on the planet are, they're certainly nothing like this. Bring every nation that you want to come and fight us. It means nothing to us. Whether it's 50 nations or 50,000 nations, it means nothing to us. Bring your planes. Bring everything you want to us because it will not harm us. Why? Because we have Allah Azza wa Jal. If anybody's ideology differs from theirs, they brand them infidels. By their rules, that gives them the right to kill, seize property and rape women. Muhammad says his father was murdered by extremists as an infidel. Featuring a young boy, very, very young, uh, and this is being released in Al Hayat Media, which is the official Islamic State media wing, and he is executing two people that ISIS claims are Russian spies. These guys are clearly the bad guys. <laughs> I mean, if ever there was a definition of a bad guy, this is it. And we're here with the soldiers of Bashar. You can see them now digging their own graves in the very place where they were stationed. When the massed ISIS militant and his comrades ready their guns and appear to execute the Syrians who dug their own graves. This is the end of every Nusayri Kafir, 
that we get a hold of. Uh, people who believe that they are holy warriors uh, and that this is their destiny to create this Islamic State. He was also then stoned to death. His alleged crime being gay. This has captured hundreds of Yazidi uh, girls and they provided them to their fighters uh, as, uh, as sex slaves, uh, saying it's uh, to bring uh, them back to the uh, glorious Islamic days of, of the past. Uh, so they're quite open that they're doing this, uh, that they're providing their fighters with hundreds of, of sex slaves. Results. Some of them as young as nine years old, is that? Bring every nation that you want to come and fight us. It means nothing to us. And so here's the thing. A 2013 poll by the Pew Research Center found that in countries throughout the Muslim world, up to 60% of Muslims support the death penalty for apostasy. So, you know how, like, if you, you stop going to church after confirmation? So these yahoos think that in Islam, that type of thing should be punishable by death. If you're a country like Egypt, that number is as high as 88%, which, that's fucking frightening. Now, that doesn't mean that each one of those Muslims will go out and try to kill infidels and apostates, but it also means that they're at least willing to look the other way, or, even worse, throw their, uh, throw their support behind it, uh, socially, physically, or, or monetarily. So, you know, that's, that's an issue. Islam, if it is a religion of peace, as, uh, as its supporters claim it is, then it needs to start acting like one, right? Religion's a choice. It's a set of ideas that you subscribe to. And there, there's nothing wrong with criticizing bad ideas. It's not a skin color or a nationality. It's not an ethnicity. You know, you can do something about it. You know, if you join a group and members of that group act violently, then I think you're compelled to do something about it. Uh, you know, speaking out against acts of violence committed on behalf of a religion is not racism. It's common sense. Um, you know, if I, if I told you that there were a significant amount of people in the world who have an imaginary friend, and sometimes that imaginary friend tells those people to go out and kill other people, you would probably say that those people are fucking lunatics. And yeah, yeah, there's no no denying that colonialism and flawed Western foreign policy have crafted uh, something of a, a shit sandwich in the Middle East, but murdering innocent people does not remove the fecal matter from in between the slices of oven-baked naan. No, no. Um, instead, it's, uh, it's like pressing the double meat button when you're ordering at Wawa. Right? The, the killing of innocent people simply adds more shit to the sandwich. And... Uh, Garnishing that meal with pages from the Quran only allows people from around the world to to look at at your faith and say, "Hey, I told you these guys were fucking nuts." Civilized people demanding that terrorism conducted in in the name of religion end is not racist. Cutting off someone's head because they're not a fucking Sunni is in fact racist and and bigoted. So. If, if Muslims want the rest of the world to change its attitude towards Islam, then Muslims are the one who have to eradicate this fucking turd from the punch bowl. And hiding behind a buzzword like Islamophobia is, is it's akin to Clark Griswold trying to fix a leak in the Hoover Dam with a piece of fucking chewing gum. Um, and look, yeah, certainly, as I said, uh, the, the Jews and Christians are not perfect, right? Uh, one need only... Look at ultra-Orthodox pockets of Judaism in Brooklyn to see that you know, they have a, a habit of treating women and children like absolute second-class citizens. There are some very disgusting aspects of, of Christianity that uh, have managed to somehow remain afloat into the year 2015. But you know what? No one rushes to the defense of the Catholic Church when, when priests were being exposed for treating young boys like fucking uh, Tickle Me Elmo. Oh, right? yeah. And by the way, if if I am wrong about this religion thing, I am uh, 
I'm going to hell for that one for sure. <laughs> oh, oh well, so I'm rolling, <laughs> rolling the dice. Um, but yeah, well, while refusing to make a cake for a gay wedding is a completely dick move, it it usually doesn't end with uh, you know shattered windows, smoking debris, and blood and fresh uh, blood and flesh splattered about the neighborhood. You now the the political left in this country claims to be a champion for gay rights, so. I guess I have to ask, where's the proportional uh, level of outcry when gays are, you know, thrown off of the roof of a building in Iraq or Syria in the name of Islam? You, you fucking nut jobs almost destroyed a mom and pop pizza shop in Indiana over a, an offhand comment about hypothetically not catering gay weddings, but when actual violence is being committed, it's no big deal because. You're scared that criticizing a brown person of a different nationality makes you a racist. And and should I get into the issues facing women in the uh, the Muslim world, or or perhaps should we ask Malala Yousafzai? Maybe maybe she can uh, fill you in. She was she was shot in the head by the Taliban because she was advocating for uh, women's rights in education. Yeah, she was she was staring down Taliban fucking gunmen. While you assholes were stroking yourselves to Jezebel articles about this non-existent wage gap. Teenage girl apparently has a bigger pair of balls than uh, Ben Affleck and Aziz Ansari combined. And, oh, and, and Aziz, by the way, who claims to be a comedian, where's his fucking outrage over the, uh, the, the attacks on Charlie Hebdo, which were conducted... May I remind you, in the name of Islam, because of a drawing of the Prophet, a bunch of people were murdered. Because, by the way, there's a significant portion of the Muslim world that agrees drawing a picture of the Prophet should be punishable by death. Jesus fucking... These fucking animals. The other day, they threw a bunch of immigrants off of a boat and into the ocean because they were Christian. For that reason alone. So the thing is this, donning an altar boy's gown and getting on your knees in front of Father O'Brien in, in the rectory is uh, its definitely going to suck, yeah. <laughs> but it's not nearly as bad as throwing on an orange jumpsuit and getting on your knees in front of Jihadi John in the Syrian desert, right? Now, Father O'Brien may leave you with a bad taste in your mouth, but ISIS isn't going to leave you with a mouth to taste with. So perhaps high-profile individuals like Aziz and Ben Affleck and Reza Aslan uh, would be better off calling on Muslims to address some of these issues and, and to sort of address this violent cancer uh, that's growing within Islam than they would throwing fucking temper tantrums anytime someone says something that could uh, possibly be construed as anti-Muslim. Because when that violent cancer metastasizes into violence in uh, Europe, Australia, and the U.S., it becomes our problem, right? When my commute into Manhattan every day turns into a game of Russian roulette, then radical Islam is our fucking problem. You know, our goal should be to live in a world where people's bodies aren't hurt by flying shrapnel, okay? Um, I'm far less worried about living in a world where people's feelings are hurt by flying words. You know, we can recover from that a tad, a tad easier. So, a lot of work to do uh, in that regard, society. Get your fucking shit together. Now, that was absolutely fucking exhausting. I actually think I could use some, uh, some ice-cold refreshment right about now. <sighs> does, uh, does anybody out there like to drink soda? Of course, of course. Who who doesn't like to drink soda, yeah? Billy likes to drink soda. <laughs> okay, okay, easy. Easy now, easy now. Pipe down, pipe down. Miss Lippy's car is green. Okay, you know what? Yeah, he was he was warned. Yeah, get him out of here. Yeah, get, get him the fuck out of here. Yeah, that's right. That's right, this is my show. You interrupt, you get bounced. I talk. My show. Yeah. All right. Yeah, now settle down, because you may not like what I have to say next, and that's because you are being lied to.
Yeah, that's right, that's right. Disingenuous soda companies who care more about your money than your well-being are selling you an ice-cold can of magic beans. Does everyone remember this commercial? Sorry guys, private party. Hmm. All right. Nope. Let's go. Summer just wouldn't be summer without the refreshing taste of Pepsi. And you're all invited. How's the full party? Just got better. Yeah, you know, the one where the uh, the bizarro Mario Lopez-looking bouncer uh, tells the two losers that they can't come into the private party, so the two losers post up outside with a, a fucking cooler full of Pepsi, and all, uh, all these chicks are flocking to them like their dicks are made out of diamond-encrusted fucking cupcakes. And you're, you're thinking to yourself, man, if I uh, drink this Pepsi stuff, I'm going to be swimming in a sea of pussy. On what fucking planet does that happen? Uh, these... These two fucking squares can't get into a party because the bootleg AC Slater, what's uh, this guy's name? Wikipedia. Andrew. Andrew Keegan. Yeah. This is the guy who's in Camp Nowhere and 10 Things I Hate About You. Hands off, Tim. This little turd is He always plays like the, the swarthy, Latino looking uh, big bad boy that all the uh, the chicks cream themselves over in those uh, those movies. Uh, so, you going to Bogey Lombard's thing on Friday night? Yeah, I might. Good. Cause you know, I'm not gonna bother if you won't. Be now there. he's doing he's doing three lines in a fucking Pepsi commercial. Now, I think he uh, he actually started his own religion. I think it's called uh, it's called Full Circle or some shit. It's like a uh, it's like a it's like a Buddhist version of Scientology. My my how the mighty have fallen. Anyway, these two these two fucking two pump chumps can't get into a pool party because they got bounced by Andrew fucking Keegan and all these hot pieces of ass are going to leave their their party and go drink soda with these fucking squares? How the fuck does that work? How shitty was this fucking pool party that that the idea of sitting in the grass and drinking Pepsi appeared to be a superior alternative? They, they didn't even have soda behind the bar at the fucking pool party, which seems kind of weird to me because people love to mix their drinks with soda. A million people are going to order Jack and Cokes and rum and Cokes, and you're going to tell me there's, no, there's not a fucking uh, soda gun back there? Like, I guarantee you can get your your hands on some sort of cola at that fucking pool party. No one's leaving that fucking pool party to hang out with these guys and drink fucking Pepsi. They presumably go over there just stone cold sober to uh, to hang out with these two losers and their their cooler full of soda. And and all of a sudden everyone's fucking dancing and having a blast. And it just seems like anyone who can get up and dance with a bunch of strangers stone cold sober in broad in broad daylight is an absolute fucking psychopath. Like, I wouldn't even, if I was Pepsi, I wouldn't even want to associate that kind of lunatic with my product. Like, if you, if you can dance sober during the day with complete strangers, you're a complete fucking weirdo. The, the only way this scenario works is if everyone at that party is just you're tripping balls on ecstasy. Like, MDMA in that, in that situation is, uh, is the great enabler. Because, to be honest, nothing else makes sense in this situation. The fatal flaw, of course, is that if you're the kind of fucking loser who shows up to a pool party with a cooler full of soda and feels comfortable dancing sober in the middle of the afternoon, then there's like a, a 0% chance that you have access to any amount of ecstasy, let alone enough to satisfy the needs of an entire pool party filled with hot chicks. So the the entire marketing premise here is just highly dubious, and I felt the need to... Uh, call out these lying cocksuckers on their, uh, their bullshit. So, you know, if I were you, I would, uh, I would, I would drop Pepsi from your soda conversation altogether. Just uh, RC Cola and Coke is all you need. Just fucking let Pepsi go. They don't care about you. Fucking cocksuckers. Um, if you were cool enough to stick around through uh, that nonsensical rambling about so soft drink Sunnis and stupid people on Twitter, then uh, I've got some fresh tunes from Sinertia on on the way as a little bit of a reward. If if you didn't stick around, then you're not here to uh, hear this anyway. So go fuck yourself. Um, all right, first before we get to the music, a a quick social media plug. 
If you're on Facebook, check us out. We are The Savage Crew uh, with Patrick Bateman as our avatar. We're also on Twitter at The Savage Crew, and you can find me on there as well. Just search Michael J. Savage. As I told you last week, Aviator Shade smoking a cigar. So Mav from Top Gun sucking off Gary Colvin, if uh, if you're wondering what my uh, avatar looks like. Uh, you can be my wingman anytime. Bullshit. You can be mine. Uh, here they are, my Savage Hour co-host Gary and his band Sinertia with uh, their song Dorado. Enjoy, and I will catch you little prick teases next time. Have a good weekend.